Hello and welcome to the True Crime and Mystery Lounge. Today we are going to take a trip up to Wisconsin to talk about the infamous case of Jeffrey Dahmer, aka the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster. Jeffrey Dahmer is one of those serial killers whose name will forever live in infamy. When you think of serial killers, he's right up there with Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, and Charles Manson. Not only because of the number of victims, but the manner in which he chose to handle the bodies after each murder. So let's go ahead and take a look at this case. Jeffrey Lionel Dahmer was born May 21, 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin to Lionel and Joyce Dahmer. At the time, Lionel was a chemistry student and Joyce was a teletype machine instructor. Lionel was a very quiet man, but due to his studies, he was away from home a lot. Joyce was a hypochondriac who had depression and would spend a lot of time in bed and demanded constant attention. Jeffrey was described as a happy and energetic child until he had to undergo surgery for a double hernia just before his fourth birthday. In school, his teachers described Jeffrey as a quiet and timid child and showed early signs of abandonment due to the fact that Joyce spent more and more time in bed while pregnant with their second child. In 1966, the family moved to Doylestown, Ohio. Joyce gave birth in December and Jeffrey was allowed to pick the name of his baby brother. He named him David. Jeffrey developed a fascination with dead animals from an early age. One day, his dad was cleaning out some dead animals from underneath the house. He placed bones into a metal bucket. Jeffrey heard the sound that the bones made when hitting the bucket and he would pick them up and drop them back in over and over again, fascinated by the sound. In 1968, the family moved again to Bath Township, Ohio. The house was surrounded by one and a half acres of woodland and there was a small hut not that far away from the house. That's where Jeffrey stored his collection of dead insects and small animals like chipmunks and squirrels, preserving them in jars of formaldehyde. During a chicken dinner, he asked his father what would happen if he placed animal bones into bleach. Thinking that Jeffrey was exploring his scientific curiosity, he showed the boy how you would go about bleaching and preserving animal bones. He took notes and used these techniques to preserve animal bones from roadkill that he would find. He also wanted to see what animals looked like on the inside. Once he was done, he would bury the animals just beside the hut, placing the skull of the animals on top of makeshift crosses. One of his friends remembers seeing a decapitated dog nailed to a tree and the skull impaled with a stick. While all of this was going on, his mother kept taking more Equinil, laxatives, and sleeping pills, keeping her away from her husband and children. Lionel and Joyce would fight almost all the time and it deeply affected the kids. By the time Jeffrey was a freshman at Revere High School, he was drinking beer and hard liquor during the daytime. He would either hide it in a flask or have it in a cup. One of his classmates asked him why he was drinking scotch in class. He would say, oh, it's just my medicine. Even though he was drinking, his teachers remembered him as being polite and highly intelligent, but with average grades. He was a good tennis player, and for a brief time, he was in the high school band. But even with these activities, Jeffrey was considered to be an outcast. The only time he would grab the attention of his peers is when he would stage pranks, which became known as doing a Dahmer. Like one time at the mall, there were free samples of sunflower seeds. He would eat the seeds, then start screaming, I'm allergic, I'm allergic, and would fake a seizure. When he hit puberty, Jeffrey knew he was gay, but never told his parents about it and just kept it hidden. He had fantasies about having complete control over his totally submissive male partner. When he was about 16, a male jogger caught his eye and he had fantasies about knocking him out and having his way with him sexually. He hid in some bushes one day with a baseball bat and waited for the same jogger to pass by, but for some reason he did not show up that day. This was his first attempt at attacking someone. By 1977, Jeffrey's grades were beginning to slip, so his parents hired a tutor. Around the same time, his parents were trying to work on their marriage by going to counseling, but once Lionel found out that Joyce had a brief affair, the marriage was over. They filed for divorce, and Lionel moved moved out temporarily to a motel. Jeffrey graduated high school in May 1978, not long after Joyce and David moved out of the house after the divorce was finalized. Joyce got custody of David and they moved to Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, leaving Jeffrey at home alone, abandoning him. Even though he was 18 and an adult, it did affect him a lot. I still think it's pretty messed up that she just left him there and didn't even tell Lionel. Like, what the hell? Anyways, I digress.
With the home now empty and no one to tell him what to do, Jeffrey started to form new fantasies in his head about picking up a hitchhiker, bringing him home, and having his way with him. While driving down the road on June 18, 1978, he noticed a male hitchhiker with his shirt off on the side of the road. He stopped to pick him up. It was Stephen Hicks, age 19. He was on his way to a rock concert at Chippewa Lake Park, Ohio. Jeffrey invited him over for a few beers. The sight of bare-chested Stephen stirred up sexual feelings, but once Steven started talking about girls, he knew any passes would be rebuffed. After several hours of talking, drinking, and listening to music, Steven decided it was time to head out, but Jeffrey wanted him to stay, so he grabbed a 10-pound dumbbell and struck Steven in the back of the head twice, knocking him out. Then he strangled him to death. Afterwards, he stripped his clothes off, exploring Steven's chest and hands. Then he masturbated over the corpse. The next day, he dissected the body in the basement. He buried the remains in a shallow grave in the backyard. Several weeks later, he dug up the remains, paring the flesh from the bones. He dissolved the flesh in acid, then flushed it down the toilet. He then crushed the bones up with a sledgehammer and scattered them in the woods behind his house. Jeffrey checked the TV and newspapers to see if anyone was looking for Stephen, but no reports were found. He had gotten away with his first murder. Six weeks after the murder, Lionel and his new fiance returned to the house to find Jeffrey was living there alone. In August, Lionel had Jeffrey enrolled in Ohio State University, majoring in business. He flunked out of his first term due to his drinking. Even though Lionel paid for his second term in advance, Jeffrey dropped out of college. Trying to find him some kind of direction, Lionel urged him to enlist in the United States Army in 1979. He trained as a medical specialist, then was shipped off to West Germany as a combat medic. Jeffrey's first year, he was reported to be an average to slightly above average soldier, but once again his drinking was a affecting his performance. So in March of 1981, he was deemed unsuitable for military service and was later discharged from the army with an honorable discharge. He was given a plane ticket to wherever he wanted to go. Jeffrey chose to go down to Miami Beach, Florida because he didn't want to have to face his father, plus he was tired of the cold weather. He got a job at a deli and lived in a motel. He would blow his paycheck on alcohol, so he was kicked out of the motel due to non-payment. He would sleep on the beach at night while still still working at the deli. It wasn't long before he grew tired and decided to call his father for help. Once he was back in Ohio, his father sent Jeffrey to live with his mother, Jeffrey's grandmother, in West Allis, Wisconsin. It seemed like things were taking a turn for the better. He attended church with his grandmother, did chores around the house, actively looked for work, but he did continue to drink and smoke. He landed a job as a phlebotomist at Milwaukee Blood Plasma Center. After 10 months of working there, he was laid off. Shortly before losing his job, he was arrested for indecent exposure. He was convicted and fined $50 plus court costs. In January 1985, Jeffrey was hired as a mixer at the Milwaukee Ambrosia Chocolate Factory, working the night shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. six days a week, getting Saturday nights off. Not long after getting his job, Jeffrey was reading at the West Ellis Public Library when a man threw a wadded up piece of paper at him. He opened it up and found it was a proposition for oral sex in the restroom. He turned it down, but this sparked those fantasies that he kept suppressed from years ago about dominating and controlling someone. Jeffrey started frequenting the gay bars, bathhouses, and bookstores in late 1985. Before that, he stole a male mannequin from a store and masturbated on it. His grandmother made him get rid of it when she found it in his closet. He seemed to like the bathhouses more because it was a more relaxing environment. But when it came time to have a bit of fun with random guys that he met, he found that he liked giving rather than receiving and didn't like the fact that they moved so much. So he started drugging their drinks so that he could have his way then leave like nothing happened. This happened a dozen times until the bathhouse found out what was going on and they revoked his membership. He would continue to visit gay bars and bookstores. Once he found someone he liked, he would take them to a hotel room and continue on as normal. Jeffrey was considered to be a honey in the gay community and he had no trouble getting dates. But he was a jealous and selfish guy, so relationships wouldn't last very long. He met Stephen Toomey on November 20th, 1987 at one of the bars. They 
they hit it off and decided to go back to the Ambassador Hotel. Jeffrey gave Stephen a drink, placed with sleeping pills, and it wasn't long before Stephen passed out. He laid down beside him and eventually blacked out as well. When he woke up, Stephen's chest was crushed in and had heavy bruising around his chest. Jeffrey himself had bruises and blood on his knuckles and bruising on his forearm. He never intended on killing Stephen and has no memory of beating him to death. He quickly cleaned himself up, went out and purchased a large suitcase, stuffed his body inside said suitcase, and took a cab home back to his grandmother's house. He severed the head, arms, and legs from the torso, stripped the flesh from the bone, cut it up into small pieces, crushing the bones with a sledgehammer, then put the parts into trash bags, then threw it away in the garbage with a normal household trash. He kept the head for a couple of weeks. Jeffrey wanted to keep the skull, so he boiled the head in a mixture of Soylex and bleach. Unfortunately for him, the process left the skull way too fragile to keep, so he crushed it up and threw it away. It seems that he had a pattern to his murders. Lured them back to his place, offered them a drink spiked with a sedative. Once the person was out, he'd strangle them. Two months later, after murdering Stephen Toomey, he met 14-year-old prostitute James Dockstater. He lured the boy back to his house with an offer of $50 to pose for nude pictures. They engaged in sexual activity, then Jeffrey gave him a drug-laced drink, waited for him to pass out, then strangled him on the cellar floor. He left the body there for one week before dismembering it, doing the same exact thing. Even tried to bleach the skull, and the same result happened. It was too brittle, so he smashed it into pieces and threw everything out in the trash. On March 24, 1988, Jeffrey met 22-year-old Richard Guerrero outside a gay bar called the Phoenix. He offered $50 to Richard just to spend the rest of the night with him. Once again, they went back to his grandmother's house, drugged him with a lace drink, then strangled him with a leather strap. He then performed oral sex on the corpse. He dismembered the body within 24 hours, but keeping the skull for several months until he threw it away in the trash. On April 23rd, he lured another man back to his grandmother's house, drugging him with some laced coffee. This time, his plans were interrupted when his grandmother walked in on him with the man. So his plans changed. He dropped the guy off at County General Hospital while he was still unconscious. Later that year, in September of 1988, Jeffrey's grandmother had had enough and asked him to move out. She was tired of his drinking and bringing young men to her home and the occasional bad smell coming from the basement and garage. So he found an apartment on North 24th Street. He moved in on September 25th, but then just two days after moving in, he was arrested for drugging and molesting a 13-year-old boy. On January 30th, 1989, he pled guilty to charges of second-degree sexual assault and of enticing a child for immoral purposes. Sentencing for the assault was suspended until May. He moved back in with his grandmother and two months after his conviction and two months prior to his sentencing, Jeffrey killed 24-year-old Anthony Sear. They met at a gay bar on March 25th, 1989. He wasn't looking to commit another murder, but shortly before the bar closed, Anthony just started talking to him. They went back to his grandmother's house, had oral sex, then gave him a drink laced with a sedative. Once he was asleep, Jeffrey strangled him. He went through his ritual of dismembering the body, but this time he placed him in the bathtub and then attempted to flay the body. He dismembered the body, putting them in the trash bags, but this time Jeffrey kept some body parts because he found Anthony to be exceptionally attractive. So he kept the head and genitalia preserving them in acetone, then stored them in a wooden box, which he later placed in his work locker. When he moved to his next apartment, he took the remains with him. On May 23, 1989, Jeffrey was sentenced to five years probation and one year in the House of Corrections with work release permits in order that he would be able to keep his job. He was also required to register as a sex offender. Two months before his scheduled release from the work camp, Jeffrey was paroled from his regime. His five year probation imposed in 1989 began at this point. He briefly stayed with his grandmother before renting an apartment of his own.
On May 14, 1990, Jeffrey moved out of his grandmother's house and into the Oxford Apartments at 924 North 25th Street, Apartment 213, taking with him the mummified remains of Anthony Sears. Even though this was a high-crime area, the apartment was close to his workplace, furnished, and at $300 per month, including all of the bills, excluding electricity, it was pretty affordable. Within a week of moving in, Jeffrey lured 32-year-old male prostitute Raymond Smith with a promise of $50 for sex. He once again drugged him with a laced drink and strangled him. The next day, he bought a Polaroid camera and took pictures of Raymond in suggestive poses. He dismembered the body in the bathroom, boiled the legs, arms, and pelvis in a steel pot with Soilex, then rinsed the bones in the sink. He put the remainder of the skeleton in the drum of acid. He was able to preserve the skull, spray painting it white. He placed the skull alongside the skull of Anthony on top of a metal filing cabinet. In June 1990, Jeffrey lured 27-year-old Edward Smith to his apartment. He drugged him, strangled him, but at this time, instead of trying to preserve the bones in the usual way, he wanted to try and freeze them in hopes it would not retain moisture, but it didn't work. So he threw them into the acid. He tried to preserve the skull by drying it in the oven, only for it to explode. Less than three months after the murder of Edward, he lured 22-year-old Ernest Miller. The two of them met just outside a bookstore. He he offered $50 just to listen to his heart and stomach. When Jeffrey attempted oral sex, Ernest said, that'll cost you extra. He got up and made him a drink, but he only had two sleeping pills left, knowing that it would not be enough. He slashed Ernest's neck with a knife. He bled to death within minutes. He took photos of the body in different poses before putting him in the bathtub. This time he would wrap up the heart, bicep, and portions of the flesh from the legs in plastic bags and place them in the fridge, which he intended on eating later. He was able to preserve more bones and the skull, painting it and placing it with the rest of his collection. He cooked the flesh with oil and vegetables and describing it as having a beef-like flavor. On September 24th, David Thomas, age 22, was approached by Jeffrey at the Grand Avenue Mall. Jeffrey persuaded him to return to his apartment for a few drinks with the additional money for nude photographs. But once he was knocked out by the sedatives, Jeffrey decided that David wasn't his type. He decided decided to strangle him anyways because he didn't want David to be angry for drugging him. He also didn't preserve any body parts but did take pictures of the dismembering process which would help identify his body later. In February 1991, Jeffrey lured 17-year-old Curtis Strauder who was standing at a bus stop. He offered money in exchange for nude photos and possibly sex. He drugged him, cuffed his hands behind his back, and strangled him with a leather strap. This time he preserved his skull, hands, and genitals and took pictures of the dismembering process. Less than two months later, on April 7th, Jeffrey met 19-year-old Errol Lindsay, who was on his way to get a key cut. He lured him back to his apartment where he drugged him, then drilled a hole on top of his head and poured hydrochloric acid into it. Errol woke up after the experiment saying, I have a headache. What time is it? Jeffrey was hoping that he would create a zombie sex slave from his experiment, but was disappointed with the results. So he drugged him again and strangled the man to death. He preserved the skull and had the body laying in the bathtub with cold water and salt, hoping to preserve it, but it became too brittle. By this time, neighbors had began to complain of the smell coming from apartment 213. The building manager spoke to Jeffrey on two occasions. His first excuse was that his freezer broke and that a lot of meat had spoiled. On the second occasion, he told him that his tropical fish had died recently and he would take care of the problem. Neighbors also complained about the noises, hearing a chainsaw and what sounded like heavy objects falling. But Jeffrey was starting to have a huge problem. Bodies were piling up and it was really getting out of control but his urges continued to take over him. On May 26, 1991, Jeffrey encountered a 14-year-old Laotian boy named Conorak Sidlisenfong on Wisconsin Avenue. He didn't know it at the time, but Conorak was the younger brother of the boy he had molested years earlier. He offered him money in exchange for nude photos. He was reluctant to go with Jeffrey, but decided to give in. He took pictures of the boy in his underwear, then drugged him and performed oral sex on him. He drilled a hole on top of Conorak's head 
head and injected hydrochloric acid into the frontal lobe. He placed the boy on the bed. Little did the boy know that on the floor of the bedroom lay the body of 31-year-old Tony Hughes, which Jeffrey had killed three days prior. He drank a few beers before deciding to go out to a bar for a few more drinks. On his way back, Jeffrey noticed Conorak had escaped and was wandering the streets naked and disoriented. Two ladies had called the police to report this and were already on the scene. Jeffrey convinced the officers that his 19-year-old boyfriend, John Hamon, had too much to drink following a lover's quarrel. The police officers bought the story and were making their way back up to Jeffrey's apartment. The women that called were extremely upset by this, but one of the officers yelled at them to butt out, shut the hell up, and do not interfere. They walked back to the apartment. Jeffrey showed the pictures and the clothes and other belongings were here, proving to them that he was telling the truth. The officers investigated the smell by briefly peeking into the bedroom, but didn't see anything, so the officers left. He gave Conorak another injection of acid, which ultimately killed him. On June 30th, Jeffrey was traveling through Chicago when 20-year-old Matt Turner caught his eye. Matt was standing at a bus stop. He offered to take him back to Milwaukee for a professional photo shoot. Once at the apartment, he drugged, strangled, and dismembered Matt and placed his head and internal organs in separate plastic bags in the freezer. Five days later, he lured 23-year-old Jeremiah Weinberger from a Chicago bar to his apartment on the promise of spending the weekend with him. He drugged Jeremiah, drilled a hole in his head, and injected him twice with boiling water, sending him into a coma from which he died two days later. On July 15th, Jeffrey encountered 24-year-old Oliver Lacey at the corner of 27th and Kilbourne, offering him money for nude photos. They engaged in sexual activity before Jeffrey drugged him. He wanted to spend more time with him, but couldn't seem to knock him out with chloroform, so he strangled him, had sex with the body, then dismembered him, keeping the head and the heart in the fridge, and placed the rest of his body in the freezer. At this time, he called in sick from work and was suspended for taking too much time off. On July 19th, Jeffrey was fired. Upon learning the news, Jeffrey lured 25-year-old Joseph Bradoff to his apartment. He strangled him and left the body laying in the bed for two days until he discovered there were maggots covering his head. He kept the head in the fridge and placed the body in the drum of acid along with his other two victims. On July 22, 1991, Jeffrey approached three men with an offer of $100 to accompany him to his apartment to pose for nude photos, drink beer, and simply keep him company. 32-year-old Tracy Edwards agreed to go back to the apartment. Upon entering the apartment, he noticed a strong smell and saw boxes of hydrochloric acid on the floor, which Jeffrey claimed to use for cleaning bricks. Jeffrey placed a handcuff on Tracy's wrist while he was distracted looking at the fish tank. He was then brought to the bedroom where the movie Exorcist 3 was playing. He noticed the blue 57 gallon drum in the corner of the room was where the smell was coming from. Jeffrey took out a knife and told him he wanted to take nude photos of him. Trying to get him on his good side, he unbuttoned his shirt, but Jeffrey simply turned around and fixated on the movie, rocking back and forth and chanting something, but Tracy couldn't quite make out what he was saying. He then turned his attention back to Tracy, putting his head on his chest and listening to his heart. Jeffrey told him he was going to eat his heart. He still had the knife in his hand. Tracy, not wanting to be attacked, reassured him that he was his friend and that he wasn't going to run away. After many hours, Tracy waited patiently, trying to figure out a way to escape. Once he thought Jeffrey wasn't paying attention, he asked if he could use the restroom. He indeed wasn't paying any attention to him, so Tracy seized the opportunity. He jumped up, punched Jeffrey in the head, and managed to figure out which lock to unlock the door, and just bolted out of the door. But before he could leave, Jeffrey tried to stop him, and Tracy kicked him in the nuts and ran. It was around 11.30 p.m. Tracy flagged down two police officers and asked them if they could just unlock the handcuff from his wrist. They both looked puzzled. Tracy explained to them what was going on. They escorted him back to Jeffrey's apartment building and told him to go up there and ask him to unlock the handcuffs. He got close to his apartment, then noped out of going anywhere near that apartment without the police's help. So they did. Jeffrey answered the door, telling the cops that the key was in his nightstand 
nightstand in his bedroom. One of the police officers entered the apartment and opened up the nightstand drawer, noticed the photos of corpses, and yelled from the bedroom, grab him. It was game over for Jeffrey. Little did those officers know that they were about to open up a Pandora's box of horror. While being pinned on the floor, he muttered, for what I did, I should be dead. Milwaukee Police Criminal Investigations Bureau conducted a more thorough search of apartment 213. Wearing hazmat suits, they found heads in the fridge and freezer, arm muscles wrapped in plastic in the deep freezer, several skulls, two preserved genitals, severed hands, a torso in the freezer, and body parts in that 55-gallon drum of acid. 74 photos of dead bodies, and there was blood on the floor in many places. It looked like something out of a horror movie. Police were just baffled as to what they were seeing. Back at the police station, Jeffrey confessed over a two-week period to every single murder he committed, from the one in Ohio, the one he did in the hotel, but he still claims he has no memory of, the three he did at his grandmother's house, and the rest that he did in that apartment. He even admitted to committing necrophilia with several bodies and with their organs. And the reason for all of this? It was a compulsion. It gave him sexual satisfaction. He also had a project in mind, an altar, a black table with seven skulls on it, incense burning a lamp with blue lights, and the skeletons of two of his victims on either side, and a black armchair. He thought he could draw the energy from these skulls and skeletons to give him more power. If they would have caught him six months later, they would have found the altar in his living room. On July 25th, 1991, Jeffrey was charged with four counts of first-degree murder. Then by August 22nd, he had been charged with a further 11 murders committed in Wisconsin. Police in Ohio found the bone fragments of his first victim victim, Stephen Hicks. In all, he was charged with 15 counts of first-degree murder. Then the separate trial in Ohio was found guilty. At a scheduled preliminary hearing on January 13, 1992, Jeffrey pled guilty but insane to 15 counts of murder. But this trial was going to be different. It wasn't about guilt or innocence. It was about whether Jeffrey was sane or insane at the time of the murders. The trial began January 30, 1992. The issue debated by opposing counsels at Dahmer's trial was to determine whether he suffered from either mental or a personality disorder. The prosecution claiming that any disorder did not deprive Jeffrey Jeffrey of the ability to appreciate the criminality of his conduct or to deprive him of the ability to resist his impulses. The defense arguing that Jeffrey suffered from a mental disease and was driven by obsession and impulses he was unable to control. Defense expert Fred Berlin testified that Dahmer was unable to conform his conduct at the time that he committed the crimes due to his paraphilia or more specifically necrophilia. The second expert witness for the defense was Dr. Judy Becker, a professor of psychiatry and psychology. She also diagnosed Jeffrey as a necrophiliac, although she added that Jeffrey had informed her he preferred comatose sexual partners to deceased ones 75% of the time. The final defense expert to testify, forensic psychiatrist Dr. Carl Wallstrom, diagnosed Jeffrey with necrophilia, borderline personality disorder, schizotypical personality disorder, alcohol dependence, and a psychotic disorder. Dr. Fred Fostel testified on behalf of the prosecution. Fostel testified to his belief that Dahmer was without mental disease or defect at the time he committed the murders. He described Jeffrey as calculating and cunning individual able to differentiate between right and wrong with the ability to control his actions and whose lust overpowered his morals. The final expert for the prosecution was forensic psychiatrist Park Dietz. He testified that he did not believe Jeffrey had any form of mental disease or defect defect at the time that he committed the crimes, stating, Dahmer went to great lengths to be alone with his victims and to have no witnesses. He explained that there was ample evidence that Dahmer prepared in advance for each murder. Therefore, his crimes were not impulsive. Both sides argued their point, and after closing arguments were finished, it was up to the jury to decide Jeffrey's fate. Will he be deemed insane and placed in a mental institution, or will he be deemed sane and sent to prison? On February 15th, the jury came back 
back with their verdict. Jeffrey Dahmer was sane at the time of the murders. With this, he would receive 15 life sentences plus 10 years for the first two counts. The victims' families were allowed to come up and make a statement. One of them was highly upset and tried to attack Jeffrey, but was stopped by the guards. Jeffrey sat stone-faced the whole time and never flinched. This was the maximum punishment he could receive since Wisconsin abolished capital punishment in 1853. He pled guilty to the murder of Stephen Hicks in Ohio and was given his 16th life sentence on May 1st, 1992. He also did not wear his glasses on purpose because he didn't want to see the victim's families. After sentencing, Jeffrey was transferred to Columbia Correctional Institution. For his first year there, he was placed in solitary confinement for his own safety. He was transferred to a less secure unit with his permission. He was given the job of cleaning the prison toilets. Shortly after his confession in 1991, he requested to have a copy of the Bible and became a born-again Christian. On his father's urging, he also read creationist books from the Institute for Creation Research. On the same day, John Wayne Gacy was being executed in Illinois. Jeffrey was baptized in the prison's whirlpool by Roy Radcliffe, a minister in the Church of Christ. He had weekly visits with Roy as well as his father would come to see him as often as possible. He also had regular contact with his mother who expressed that she worried about his safety, to which he responded with, it doesn't matter mom, I don't care if something happens to me. One of the other prisoners tried to slash his throat with a razor attached to a toothbrush after chapel service was over, but he only received superficial wounds. He had his last interview with Stone Phillips from Dateline NBC. Jeffrey was calm and expressed that he takes full responsibility for what he did and that blaming someone else was just a cop-out. He also explained that his main motive was to take the best-looking guy and keep him for as long as possible, even if it's just a part of him. That's also why he committed cannibalism, to have them be a part of him. He swore up and down that it was never about hate. He hated no one. He was very polite and at one point hugged his dad who was sitting beside him. On the morning of November 28, 1994, Jeffrey was let out of his cell for his normal work detail. With him were fellow inmates Jesse Anderson and Christopher Scarver. They were left unsupervised for 20 minutes in the bathroom of the gym. When the guards came back around 8:10 a.m., they found both Jeffrey and Jesse on the floor with wounds to their heads. It appears they were beaten with a piece of gym equipment. They were rushed to the hospital, but Jeffrey was pronounced dead within an hour. Jesse died from his wounds two days later. Jesse was found to have defense wounds on his arms and hands, but Jeffrey had no defense wounds at all. He made no noise as he was being beaten. Christopher was already serving a life sentence for the murder he committed back in 1990. After beating both men to death, he went back to his cell. When they asked him why he did it, he said God told him to do it. Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer are dead. Upon learning of his death, Jeffrey's mother Joyce responded angrily to the media. Now is everyone happy? Now that he's bludgeoned to death? Is that good enough for everyone? The reaction from the victim's families were mixed. Christopher Scarver received two more life sentences for the murder of Jesse Anderson and Jeffrey Dahmer. In his will, Jeffrey stated that he didn't want a funeral and he wanted to be cremated. His wishes were carried out and his ashes were split between his parents. He was 34 years old. On August 5, 1981, as the nature and scale of Dahmer's crimes initially came to light, a candlelight vigil to celebrate and heal the Milwaukee community was attended by more than 400 people. Present at the vigil were community leaders, gay rights activists, and family members of several of Dahmer's victims. Organizers stated that the purpose of the vigil was to enable Milwaukeeans to share their feelings of pain and anger over what happened. The Oxford apartment building was demolished in November of 19. It now sits as a vacant lot. Ideas of making it into a memorial park, a playground, or new housing never materialized. A few civil lawsuits were filed against the police and the Dahmer estate. Lionel retired and now lives with his second wife. In 1994, Lionel published a book, A Father's Story, and donated a portion of the proceeds from his book to the victim's families. Most of the families showed support for Lionel and Sherry, although three families subsequently sued Lionel, two for using 
signing their names in the book without obtaining prior consent, and a third family, that of Stephen Hicks, filing a wrongful death lawsuit against Lionel, Sherry, and former wife Joyce, citing parental negligence as the cause for the claim. In the book, Lionel blames Joyce for taking too many meds while pregnant and that she would have frequent seizures while pregnant with both children, which the doctor would have to make a house call to give her a shot of morphine. Joyce said that Lionel's claims were ridiculous and that she had a normal pregnancy with Jeffrey and David. Joyce died of cancer in November of 2000. Prior to her death, she attempted suicide on at least one occasion. Jeffrey's younger brother, David, changed his surname and lives in anonymity. Can't say I blame him. And trust me, the irony is not lost on me that Jeffrey died in the same manner as his first victim. I know that everybody and their dog has covered Jeffrey Dahmer, but I wanted to cover him because out of all the serial killers I've researched over the years, he's by far my favorite because he's just so fascinating. His thought process is so unusual and his obsessions were the strangest things I've ever heard of. And for him to talk about killing and having sex and eating some of his victims, like it's the most normal thing for him. Of course, the fact that he looks so normal, not really good looking, but just average. You can never tell from just a passing glance that he was capable of doing the things that he did. Even though a lot of people in our society find it odd that someone who is a fan of true crime would have a favorite serial killer, a lot of people do, for one reason or another. I would love for those who have stuck around until the end, let me know in the comments down below who is your favorite and why. If you enjoyed this video, please smash that like button and if you really like what I do, subscribe will you? And when you do, don't forget to tickle that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on the next episode. You never know who I will cover next. Thank you for hanging out with me in the True Crime and Mystery Lounge. This is Phoenix signing out. Have a good evening and stay safe.